Hello everyone, my name is Matt, you can call me the Historical Gamer, or I'm the Historical Gamer and you can call me Matt. I'm here today with Jean Marciniak, uh, I hope I got your last name right, he's also known as the Strategy War Gamer, uh, who is uh, my, co my compadre, my partner in crime in the Single Malt Strategy Podcast, of which this is episode 16. How are you doing today, Jean? Not bad, man. Not bad. 16, that's not too bad. And uh, I'm a compadre. I like that. I, I like that. So I'm going to use that more often. <laughs> episode Sweet 16. It's our Sweet 16 episode. I don't, I don't know if it's special, but hey. What have you been... This is getting weird. What have you been playing lately? <laughs> uh, well, uh, so a couple of games. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a, co there's a game that I, I've been playing data wise, but I'm going to save that for the next episode because that's going to uh, align with the release date of Battle uh, Star Galactica. That, yeah, a little bit. <laughs> um, but you know, um, the last I would say 24 hours, I've been playing a lot of uh, you know um, real politic, and um, it came. It just recently came out on. Um, iOS. I don't know if many of our listeners have ever played this game, but uh, you know, I, I, I saw it on um, the App Store about like two, three weeks ago, and it got me very interested. It was a game that, when I looked at the screenshots and video of it, um, it kind of reminded me of Superpower. I don't know if a lot of our listeners have ever played that game, but it's a you know early two thousands kind of game where you kind of could choose any modern day nation, kind of like run run the country kind of like hearts of iron but modern day kind of thing and uh, yeah it even doesn't it have like a bad boy score or a warmonger score or something like that and i was kind of thinking to myself what the heck is is paradox making this game because that was like a thing that the hearts of iron games had right yeah i was you know i uh so you know the weird thing about it is i was very i was very you know hesitant with uh getting this game because the last promised hearts of iron paradox kind of uh uh game that was supposed to be all hyped up uh for ios for people that have iphones and ipads and you know that that utilize them on a daily basis um you know it was supposed to be hearts of, uh, hearts of iron and victoria was supposed to come out for the uh ipad and iphone and uh, a developer, I forgot the name of them, um, but they came out with the game called Strategy and Tactics. This was about uh, about like a year or two ago, and I, I, I made a review about it on my uh, on my site, on my YouTube channel. And it was supposed to be like you know Hearts of Iron and Victoria for you know for iOS, and it absolutely crashed. It was just completely, you know, like the partnership between this developer, I forgot the name, and Paradox completely unfolded and they were like, well, we're going to make a Hearts Iron game, light game for the iOS uh, and it's going to be great. And they came out with it and I downloaded it and I was like, holy crap, I'm actually going to play Hearts Iron on my iPad. This is going to be insane and maybe on my iPhone. And the game was just complete cluster. It was just a cluster frack that you could, oh, it was just horrible. And I kind of like set aside that whole genre. I said, you know, this will never happen until I actually picked up real politic. And uh, I did a first impressions. I actually uploaded it today and I was really surprised by it. Um, I know you, you mentioned that you played it for the iOS and the desktop version. Uh, so I have a lot of questions for you, but I wanted to know your initial impressions of it. Uh, how do you, how, how you felt about the game? Um, uh, not only as a desktop or iOS platform, but the game in general. I may be a bad person to gauge their their opinion of the game. I've played it, but not as much as I would have liked by this point. Um, I thought it's... I, I agree with you in that it reminds me a lot of Super Power. I think it's more Super Power 1 than Super Power 2. I don't know if you played Super Power 2 at all, but the original Super Power was much more of a, you know, attempted to feel like a more serious modern-day... Uh, nation simulation. Superpower Two got really cartoony and weird. Um, oh, really? I never played Superpower Two, so if, yeah, you, it was you like, like you just have kind of it's just the the whole feel of the game. It was still essentially the same game, but it was a little bit more uh, mi not microy. It was less microy. It was more streamlined. The care you had these weird characters that were almost like cartoon figures, kind of representing. Uh, the uh, leaders of different countries. It, it just felt like they went from saying our intention is to make a, a serious 
uh, strategy game about being a world leader to saying, let's make a, a fun, lighthearted, kind of funny game about being a world leader. And it, it didn't really work, in, in my opinion. Wow, I'm sort of, I, I mean, I, I enjoyed Super Power 1. Uh, I didn't play Super Power 2 because uh, there was a lot of, and, you know, maybe I should have gave it a chance, but, uh, you know, Super Power 1, there's a couple of problems that I, I had with it. Um, a couple of things was like, or if you remember when you went to like a tactical battle between like, I believe two armies and they placed units on a map and it was like a tactical map. And one was on one end, obviously your country is on the other and you kind of fought and they went over terrain. Like literally you had units that go over a mountain and it was just kind of like the equivalent of, you know, a grassy field. It was, it, tactics weren't really a, an issue in that game. It was just like, Hey, we're just going to have these two armies. Um, collide with one another and the battle is just auto set. I don't even really, I don't I don't I don't believe the player actually even had control over the armies in the tactical battle. Maybe I'm I'm wrong, but um I remember it was like it was just too um it it was just too hands off and um I did appreciate the strategic aspect of hearts uh, of superpower in terms of what you can do with your country, but uh, I felt there was a big chunk mix missing from that game. I feel like I may have been mistaking Superpower 2 for a different game I played, uh, now that I'm looking at some of these images. But but yeah, in general, you're right. Uh, when it comes to the, um, the, the, the combat, it was much more kind of uh, hands-off, which, again, I know you're always wanting to be in control and you want to be you know, the captain along with the brigadier general, along with the chief of staff, I'm along so with the president, <laughs> along with along with God. Um, but in my opinion, the combat was okay. It was very, your, to your point, there was no semblance of tactics. It was always, almost like two forces smash themselves together, and depending on the um, sort of the uh, mixture of forces as well as the number of forces, one side or the other will more or less obliterate the other and, and win the battle. So the actual combat was kind of secondary to me. Um, outside of the nuclear attacks, which was well, were always fun to watch when you kind of went into like strategic mode and you get the red and black map with the little tracks of the missiles, tra- you know, traveling across the, it almost became like a little DEF CON game, um, yeah. oh. which was always fun if you had lots of nuclear weapons. Uh, I found myself playing as South Africa all the time and kind of oh, attempting really? to create Africa. Af- um, maybe like, it was, it, I felt like playing in South Africa, it was easier to create your own empire and conquer other countries without too much political backlash. Because one uh, of the things that game always had was, you know, you could attack another country, but one, depending on who you're attacking, and two, depending on how often you've attacked other countries, you know, other countries would form alliances and rise up against you so that at some point, you know, if you were, if you weren't careful, you could end up uh, at war with countries vastly more powerful than yourself. And to me, it felt like South Africa was always that nice mix of a, a good, strong economy with an ability to build your own equipment or afford, uh, you know, buying equipment from others uh, with a opportunistic uh, territory around you where you could you could take advantage of some of your neighboring countries and invade them uh, without too much uh, political backlash uh, from the rest of the world. I didn't even think of that. That's actually pretty cool. Because, I mean, obviously, if you're in Europe, you know, if if uh, uh, France is ex Germany, there's going to be a lot of uh, political backlash there. Yeah, and I mean, it kind of give you like a score and a ranking. If the U.S. just starts steamrolling other countries, then you're going to quickly end up at war with half the rest of the world because everyone knows you're the U.S. and you're super powerful. You can kind of get ignored if you're a smaller or less powerful country in that game. Um, which I'm kind of curious, in real politique, have you seen kind of similar behavior. I noticed as I was playing the game the other day, I was playing as Argentina and I invaded Uruguay. I did notice the game has like a, a bad boy or what's it called? Uh, a, um, what is it called? There's a, there's like a score in there that basically tracks how aggressive you've been and, and how other nations feel about oh, you. Yeah. Uh, I think it's your warmonger yeah. score. Yes, exactly. Yeah. It's the warmonger score. Yeah. So I'm assuming that's something like Bad Boy in Hearts of Iron, where like when your number goes higher and higher, countries will kind of come at come at you if uh, if if it goes too high. Is that right? Um, you know, I only played about 40 minutes of the game. I'm still trying to get a hand of it. Um, so I just only did like a first impressions, kind of like a, a you know a first touch on the game. Um, I haven't ran. I haven't declared war on anybody. I'm very particular when I started like a. I, 
Who are you playing as? What, what, what? No, I'm sorry. Who are you playing as? Oh, uh, is the U.S. Oh, okay. So you've already got all the bells and whistles, and you can steamroll whoever you want if you really want to. <laughs> yeah, but then if I steamroll anybody, then Russia's going to get out my case, and they're going to be like, "Hey, what are you doing?" You know, kind of thing, you know, or China or something like that. Uh, um, I, you know, there's a, a war between in one of my scenarios between Guyana and Venezuela. And I was thinking about getting into it. And I was like, all right, whoever's democracy, I'm going to back you. And they're both authoritarian. Uh, so I'm like, oh, that sucks. All right, I'm not going to help either one of you guys. So you, you all fight it out, whatever you want to do. Um, but, uh, th- I mean, there's a couple of cool things I like about the game. Um, the one really cool, uh, really big thing on top of my list I would have to put is the game feels deluxe. I mean, I bought it, you know, for five ninety nine on the App Store. And I noticed that f- buying f- this game for five ninety nine, there's a lot of the game has a lot of substance in terms of longevity. Uh, like there's a diplomacy section, there's a kind of a technology section, there's a military section, there's an economy section. You can deal with a uh, foreign section with terms of uh, UN actions, like uh, like if somebody's you could do a non profilerate uh, Oh, gosh, I'm going to fuck this up. But a non profilerate uh, whatever the word is. There you go. <laughs> that kind of, uh, you know, for, uh, for arms or uh, nuclear deterrence. Um, I really appreciated, you know, the, the amount of actions I can do in terms of su- suggesting the UN. And that's one of the things that I brought up to the UN was a non uh, uh, prof- f- f- Oh man, I'm gonna screw that up. But anyway, non-proliferation treaty. Um, and I had a couple of uh interesting parties that were supportive and a couple of interesting parties that were against. I, I found out that I think in my scenario, one of the scenarios I was playing, the UK was against this uh treaty, and I was like, Are you kidding me? Are you serious? Like Russia was long uh, I'm sorry, China was alongside with them. I was like, why don't you back me? But anyway, um I really liked how the game was so deluxe that it gave you so many options. And in a couple of scenarios, you have, uh, you know, numerous scenarios. I think it was about four or five of them. And considering that you can choose not only the U.S., but dozens of other countries from South Africa to Israel to Palestine to um, to Germany, France, you know, all the con- uh, numerous countries throughout the world. Um, the one thing I appreciated about this game is the... Uh, the longevity of it you you know you could play a game with the u.s for three four weeks and just say all right you know i won this game let me start this game as south africa and see how this goes or let me start this game as palestine and see how far this goes so you can literally spend 5.99 on this game and then you could be playing it a year and a half down the road and i think that's a that's a pretty good value yeah i thought the i know it's uh, on ios i think it's on android or about to come out on android um, so, I mean, re- real politics seems to be a true cross-platform game, which has, as far as I can tell, all of the same features on mobile as it does on PC. I do think the user interface is more suited to a PC experience. It's not that it's difficult to play, but at least if you're playing on a phone, things are a little bit crowded. It's probably a little bit better on a tablet. Um, but overall, it, it works. Um, it's It seems like it's reasonably well put together. I haven't noticed any huge bugs. Uh, granted, I've only been playing it for a little bit. Um, one of the things, and, and I know maybe we can revisit this when we're a little bit uh, more um, in tune with the game, uh, once we've played it a little bit more. Uh, but one of the things I wonder is, do games like this work when you're playing the modern world? in a grand strategy game, which if we're being honest, you know, your goal is to conquer countries, right? Like when you're playing this kind of, this kind of game, the intention is not to play peaceably and just kind of keep the world going status quo, right? The intention is to to build an empire or am I crazy for viewing all of these games in that way? I've just never seen a game that's trying to say, all right, here's your diplomatic objectives and be peaceful, like maybe democracy, like if you play that game, but that's an entirely different kind of game. Do games that put you in charge of a country in the modern world, and by modern I mean present day, and, you know, are built like this, which are it's basically like a modern day Hearts of Iron, do those work? I would say, you know, 
you know, I would say if I, if I have to bring it up, uh, I mean, if, if I have to refer, uh, reference another game, um, a game that I want to bring up, and I, I know I mentioned this game in the past in a previous uh, podcast, was um, East vs. West. And I think that game has a lot of substance in terms of uh, in terms of conquer a world, uh, I, I feel like if I, as a player, wanted to play a game like East vs. West, and I, you know, there's, I don't know if uh, a lot of our listeners have uh, are know uh, are familiar with it, but the actual beta was released, uh, not by Paradox, but some crazy fan probably uh, posted it on uh, forums, and I was able to download it, and I was able to play the beta of it uh, before, uh, you know, before the whole game was canceled. And when I was playing it, uh, even though it was a rough beta, you know, I didn't feel like that sensation of like, I have to rule the world uh, when I was playing the US. I felt like I had to deal with crises like, you know, uh, Korea crisis and uh, dealing with uh, Soviet expansion in Europe and stuff like that. Um, So it was more of uh, addressing conflicts and regions. Um, Playing real politic, I feel, you know, the game is very new to me, so it honestly feels like a superpower, and I, I would have to say it's it kind of feels like, as the U.S., when I'm playing it, I feel like I'm trying to, basically, like you were saying, conquer the world. I'm trying to, you know, expand my influence throughout the world, and, you know, uh, the, the way the military section is set up, I think it's uh, designed more of like a risk kind of system where you're sending uh, soldiers and airplanes and Navy to a certain uh, country and they just battle it out and you control that country and such. Um, because I don't, I, I don't see like a hard to iron system where you, you set up like the fourth fleet or the fifth fleet and you sign, you know, five aircraft carriers and two of them are nuclear based and one nuclear sub with, you know, ICBMs attached to it and such. Um, so I don't see that long with in this game. So I feel like this is more of a, like you were saying, conquer the world kind of uh, situation. Um, but they get, they do give you different avenues to pursue that in terms of handling it through economy, I guess, um, as well as UN actions. Uh, so it is a kind of like a risk type game, but a lot of a lot more. Um, options to get to the end game you know it's not just like hey here are your armies conquer the world it's more like hey here's your army here's the un here's the diplomacy here's your economy here's this conquer the world and it's it it kind of makes that much more difficult yeah and i guess uh, i agree with you and it to me it's you're right it's not really hearts of iron because there's no front lines per se i mean you you issue orders to your military when you fight uh, but it's not it's not a create a core and launch a flanking maneuver here. It's kind of along the lines of, all right, you're at war. You click on the province or the country or whatever that you're trying to attack. You can assign forces. You have a certain number of forces based on what you've built and, and what have you. And then you can assign those. You then choose certain types of missions that you want your forces to go after. So you could uh, have an ambush defensive. You could have a focused offensive. You could have a disorganized offensive. And then whatever that result occurs, it just kind of simulates it abstractly with your guys versus the bad guys. You don't really see anything. It just kind of numbers. And then you've kind of got like this green status bar or progress bar that ebbs and flows very much like in in superpower. And when it goes to all one side, your, your mission's either a failure or a success. And if it's a success, you get a war score. Again, very much in that sense, very much like Hearts of Iron where you build this war score up or any of the paradox games really and if you get the war score to 100 then then you win you know you can basically dictate terms you can get peace earlier than that but if you want to conquer someone you're probably going to have to have a war score of 100 so and the other side does the same thing they pick their own missions they you know assign their forces and their mission can be successful or or unsuccessful and it's just kind of like two sides are kind of saying all right I want I want to launch a disorganized offensive okay that worked now I want to launch an airstrike okay now that worked now I want to attack the air bases like seize the air bases with ground forces there's no front line as far as I can tell I've only fought wars with small countries so far so maybe we come back to this later and kind of correct this assessment But there's no front line per se that I can see. It's just a matter of assigning missions, assigning forces, and building up a war score where you can dictate the terms the way that you see fit. 
if you do get a hundred war score, in my experience, the war kind of ends and you just kind of sit there until you negotiate peace. The war is still going on, but the, the, the combat missions stop at that point. Um, but yeah, it's, it's kind of a, I would say that the combat feels a little bit half thought out. It does feel like, Hey, okay, if you're the president, maybe this is the kind of direction you'd be issuing. But on the flip side, I, I do think there's a little bit of a lack of, um, feeling of ebb and flow in the way that a real war would feel. You certainly take casualties. You can certainly fail at missions and lose, but I don't get a sense of I lost, therefore I lost this province. It's just I lost, I lost these troops, and therefore the war score against me went up and, and my own war score went down. I'm curious. Uh, if you, you mentioned you play the PC version and the iOS version. Is there any difference or are they completely... The same. Um, they seem the same to me, as far as I can tell. I've only spent maybe like an hour on my phone version and maybe an hour on the computer version. Um, one thing the game does do differently uh, than Superpower is, to me, in my experience, Superpower was very much in the vein of this is modern day and here's the world and fight it out or do whatever. And this game has scenarios which seem to place emphasis on, you know, alternative outcome or alternative near future scenarios. I don't know if that's like an attempt to make the world more realistic. Uh, but like if you if you create a new game, for example, I'm doing it right now, um, you'll you'll have multiple different options of, of the game you want to play. There's a sandbox, but but most of these seem to be near future. So, for example, there's one called The World Is Not Enough that takes place in 2020. So that you know, 2020, it's more or less present day, but it's a little bit in the future, so it can kind of make things maybe a little bit more interesting or, you know, more historically plausible. But then you've got a, you know, 2050 scenario, which is basically World War Three has occurred and, and the globe is totally different. Uh, and then there's a 2022, which I have not even looked at or played, uh, which is sort of just sort of a... I think it's just supposed to be like a, fan, a f fantastic sort of fanciful uh futuristic world europe is like 40 different countries france is gaul the united states is broken apart into like 50 different countries i mean i think that's more of just like a fantasy world uh but they again most of the scenario none of the scenarios are present day the closest one is like four years into the future wow okay that's interesting i um but you know the cool thing about it is i mean for 599 you you, in essence, get the desktop version of the game, which I thought was kind of cool. And the big thing that I really loved about it was, well, two, a couple of big, big things. Um, I love that it's available on iPhone. So if you purchase on the iPad for five nine nine, you get the iPhone version for free. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, also, they have cross-device saves. So if I, you know, like I start my games on my iPad... Um, I was at the bar today and I was just um, waiting for uh, my friend. She was, she's always late. So, you know, generally like I have about an hour before she shows up. So these are like the moments where I can say, or what, you know, I can send my emails out or I can say, you know what, I can, you know, pick up a game of real politics and continue that on my, I, you know, from my iPad on my iPhone. So those come in, you know, extremely handy. And I really appreciate developers that, you know, um, identify that and, and, and I did, you know, do the cross device saves because, um, you know, being able to continue on your iPhone when you're in a spot where you're like, all right, I got about like 40 minutes to kill. I got a nice cold beer in front of me, I got my phone with me. Uh, what can I do? And I sent my emails out. This would be a perfect time to just complete a couple of moves. So I, I do like that they do that. I, I I'm, I'm just kind of curious if, uh, if that is kind of cross compatible, I know it's cross compatible between the iPad and iPhone. I'm just kind of uh, curious if it's cross compatible between iPhone, iPad, and the desktop version of the game. I don't know. I haven't tried. Um, something tells me I doubt that it's cross PC to iOS, um, but I, I could be wrong. What are the um, What are the things that you, did you uh, really enjoy about the game? Um, the loading that, screens that, that really. Like, Yes. <laughs> now you know, you brought that up. I know everyone's going to be like, wait, what? I, if, You're mentioning the loading screens? Like, seriously, is this a joke? But in all honesty, <laughs> these things are freaking fantastic. They basically create... So um, anytime you're 
swapping between screens in the menu or anytime the game is loading, you'll get a loading screen. And it usually only lasts for like a split second, right? But it's so damn just pleasing. Like I'm looking at one right now, which shows Angela <laughs> Merkel uh, playing the game. Like it shows her in front of a computer, looks like a Mac, playing the game. I mean, I'm sorry, but there's one with like, uh, is it Vladimir Putin? He's got like a blanket. He's like curled up on a sofa with like a blanket over him. I think he's playing on his phone or something like that. Um, and then there's one. What is Obama doing? I can't. I can't remember. They've also got one of Trump. He he's like a bellboy in like a hos- in like a hotel, like which makes sense if you think about like Trump being like a a retail magnet or whatever. You know, they have him as a bellboy, presumably at one of his hotels. They've got Vladimir Putin playing the game on uh, on his couch uh, with a PC in front of him. Actually, um, I'm looking for the Obama one as well, but it's just kind of it's kind of cool. Like I've seen Merkel, I've seen Obama, I've seen Trump. I've seen Putin. Um, I don't know if I've... Oh, yeah. Uh, Obama is, like, sitting in a train. He's, like, on a train playing on his laptop. Yeah, that was awesome. It was like a MacBook Air. I was looking at it. I was like, that looks like a MacBook Air. They all look like iOS devices, I think, except for the one that Putin's playing on. Yeah, I was I was kind of surprised. I was, like, when I first uh, started the game up, and I was looking at uh, I was looking at it, and it had, like, a little boy, bellboy, and it looked like Trump, and I was like... Okay, they're trying to make a political uh, kind of uh, commentary there, you know. And then I was just like, I was wondering if it was just Trump. And then, you know, I started the game and it just switched to Obama. And then um, uh, Merkel from Germany, I was like, oh, well, I'm just kind of curious if they made all these leaders. But it looks like it just recycled between uh, those, uh, those three or four of them. Yeah, I don't think it's a political. I mean, like, it makes sense that Trump would be in a hotel if you think about it. Um, but I don't think they're trying to make a, a, a political statement, just given that. You know, it's not like it's making Merkel or Obama or Putin or Trump or any of them really to look better than the others. So, I, uh, you know, a couple of things uh, I don't know if you noticed. I wanted to get your feedback on this. Was uh, so I only played it, you know, for our listeners. I only played it on the iPad. Um, I haven't played it on my iPhone uh, yet. Uh, I was at the bar today, but I didn't get a chance to do it. I was planning to do it, but um, so I got a chance to play on my iPad and I have an iPad Air too. Um, but as I was zooming in and zooming out and I was going through like statistics, I was trying to figure out how many troops the Russians had, Navy, Air Force and such versus my uh, U.S. Component. I just send everybody in when I go to war. I literally send everything. <laughs> I, well, I can't I can't find a reason not to. I granted, I haven't been involved in a multi front war against a large enemy country yet. But to me, I don't see a pro or a con to holding back forces. I, I could be wrong. I'm just, you know, like, like you were saying, you know, I, I guess the whole going to war kind of situation is, could be expanded. I would say, you know, it could be more uh, tactical based. I would say more hard to iron based, right? Like if they can combine superpower hard to iron, I think that would make this game feel more deluxe because it would make it feel more, um, you know, global in terms of uh, conflict. Cause I feel like when you're sending forces, I haven't done it. I haven't gone to war with anybody yet, but I feel like if I'm sending forces, I'm sending like uh, 13 divisions to, you know, Guyana, to fight Guyana or, you know, um, you know, another 15 divisions to fight, you know, uh, whatever, Romania, whatever it may be. Um, I'm not actually controlling those divisions. Right. No, not as far as I can tell. No, there's no real way. I mean, you can, you can control what you're assigning, to um to an attack but you can't control um the actual like you're not going to swing in around someone's flank i will say i i think this is a game that might be worth coming back to i I don't think it's got the best reviews i think it may be a little bit shallow but i think it'd be i'd be curious to see uh how i feel about this game once i have more time to play it because like i just pulled up on my phone here and, and it does a surprisingly good job of making this game which is a rather large game and rather detailed user interface work on a small screen like a phone um but i'm i'm pulling up the nuclear weapons section and you know i could launch weapons and things like that but it also has an environmental impact of your nuclear war which is not something that really uh, superpower ever had and no. it's kind of got a scale of like minor problems climate anomalies and nuclear winter yeah. so like as you oh. engage in greater levels of, of nuclear conflict it appears uh that that you can um 
th- that it has different influences on the environment. So again, I think it hasn't been that well received, but I'd be really curious to dig into it in more detail and maybe make an entire episode uh, about the game once both of us have a little bit more time to dig into it. I got a preview copy from the developers for the phone version. Um, I had already actually purchased the computer version, uh, but it's just one of those games that with everything else going on and, and all my other stuff that I've been working on, I haven't had a chance to devote as much time to it as I would like, uh, but it looks interesting and looks like something that might be worth uh, looking at closer. But I guess my question that I was trying to get at earlier was, do you think modern games like this really have a, an ability to work? And the reason I ask is like, if you're playing in the middle ages, right? And you're a country and you want to just go around conquering everybody, that's plausible. You can do that. It, the the world in the Middle Ages is built for video games of people who want to conquer the world. It just is. Even if you go into colonialism and you're playing like Victoria, that is a game that is built for you to build an empire and to struggle with other countries to do it. The game is built that way, but so was that era of history if you're talking about modeling it in a video game. Even through World War I, you've got the gigantic world conflict. You can easily model the struggle between countries there. World War II is a war gamer's goldmine, as well as strategy gamers, because it was such a grand scope, a grand affair. And again, you had alliance blocks going against each other, and you had countries literally trying to take over everything they could. But once you get into the Cold War, and it's not just nuclear weapons. Maybe it's the impact nuclear weapons have had on the world. But it almost seems like once you get into the Cold War era, it's a lot harder. The wars become less clear. They're not quite as clear-cut. Countries aren't... It's not okay for people to just roll around invading everybody around them. Um, And and especially in the modern world. Like, you're going to make a war game about fighting terrorism, but you're the president of the United States? Like, that's... It's, you know, you, you'd probably be a lot more fun to be the president during World War II, and I'm using fun loosely, obviously, not a fun war. But I don't think... I'm not sure the modern era of sort of diplomacy-centric um, relation, diplomacy-centric world order, I guess is what I would call it. I'm not sure games have yet figured out how to make that interesting and yet still feel authentic. Superpower was a lot of fun, but kind of crazy, like just rolling around invading countries. Real politique is intriguing, but I don't sense a deep, you know, uh, diplo- diplomatic system that that tries to figure out how to deal with the modern world in underneath the hood. I mean, in my limited playing time, I've seen like half a dozen wars start with other AI countries invading other AI countries. And I just don't like, okay, great. From a gameplay perspective, it's fun to have everybody invading everybody. But from a uh, feeling authentic and feeling like you're modeling the real world, um, that should be pretty rare and, and far between. I just, are, are, is the modern era ever going to be, is anyone ever going to figure out how to modern, to model the modern era uh, effectively and compellingly where you say this feels right? I think it comes down to, uh, and I, I do feel like if done properly, it can be, well, exactly done properly. Is I, I think it really comes down to is, um, you know, what would I do, you know, um, and I think that's where a lot of people is allure. WWJD. Hey, that works for you. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> what would you, yeah, exactly. What would John do? Or what would, what would, yeah, I like that. Um, so, you know, honestly, that that's what I feel like, it, you know, where this genre lies is what would I do in terms of like, if you give, a modern era game like real politics or hearts of iron kind of clone, but for modern day where you set up the world, you can set up events where, you know, you have ISIS or, you know, the Taliban or nine 11, uh, you know, the Boston marathon, uh, you know, issue uh, events that pop up uh, through the game that I, I understand that might be very, uh, you know, like for example, the Boston Marathon is only a couple of years ago, so it's a very um, traumatic uh, period in American history uh, because uh, a lot of people, you know, it's not like 1941 where there's, uh, you know, it's deep into history and you know people look at it a different eye. But with the modern day era uh, war game, strategy game, um, 
there's always that, what would I do? Like if it's 2001, would I invade Afghanistan? Uh, should I just send special forces? Should I just do bombings? Uh, dealing, dealing with ISIS in, you know, the uh, mid 2010s, uh, uh, you know, should I just send, you know, warplanes, bomb, you know, them in Syria and Iraq, or should I send ground troops, should I uh, assist the Russians, should I assist the rebels uh, in terms of the Kurds and fight back that way? Um, Should I, what should I do with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? I feel like there's a lot of different avenues to pursue. And it's not as broad as in like, all right, it's World War II, I have to defeat Germany, Nazi Germany, uh, and I have to do it as quick as I can because they're the bad guy. I believe in a modern day scenario, there's, the world has changed so much that, you know, y- you know, you can't really say, all right, they're the bad guy or they're the good guy because it's so it's so prevalent, so modern day, you know, and everybody's so uh, biased in terms of culture and politics that, you know, some people will say, well, I'm going to align myself to Israelis because of this. I'm going to align myself to the Palestinians because of that. And I don't want to dive into politics or anything like that, but I feel like there's numerous avenues you can pursue with a game like that. And it's very, you have to pursue, you have to be very, um, what's the word? Um, uh, careful on uh, the way you set up this scenario um, so you don't give either uh, party preference or anything like that. But I feel like if you put like 2001, uh, this is the way the world is. Uh, the U.S. just got attacked. 9-11 just happened. You're the U.S. Go. And I feel like that's going to add like a big gameplay component. This is why I really like real politics. When I started up, I feel like, holy crap. All right. So I'm the U.S., I'm in charge of the economy. I'm in charge of the UN, not the charge of the UN, but I have a significant impact on the UN. Have you ever, by the way, not to interrupt yeah. you, but have you ever played the geopolitical simulator uh, game? I think the newest one out is called Power and Revolution. No, is is it's that by for... Eversim? So there's, I think they made a, one of the versions of Race for the White House and and World of Leaders, but kind of what it seems like their their most popular games are like. Masters of the World, Power and Revolution. Uh, these are uh, games that are very similar to super, Superpower as well, but it's like a series of games that I think have been really knocked. They're, they're like $50 games, and they've been knocked because they've been really buggy is kind of my understanding. They've got kind of really mixed reviews or negative reviews on Steam. But I'm kind of curious if, if you've given those a try because those also might be worthwhile of, of taking a look at uh, also. Um, cause they kind of play in the same sandbox and I've got power and revolution, which again, it introduces things like ISIS, uh, but I just haven't, uh, haven't had a chance to really play it much. I think I am looking at my steam account right now. I've only played it for 30 minutes. You know, what we might want to do in a future episode is just make an entire episode looking at these games in more de- detail to kind of evaluate that. Cause to your point, I think, you know, I think it could be done. But I think it's so outside the vein of what we're used to seeing from these kind of games that I don't know if the modern world fits well in the standard carbon cutter, you know, uh, cookie cutter um, uh, mentality that we have. I think we think, all right, it worked for Crusader Kings 2, cut and paste and put it in the modern world. And that doesn't work. You need a different approach. You need a different... Uh, value prop you need different objectives you need you know a whole different way of approaching the world than you can in world war ii or, or than you can in world war one or, or or the middle ages or the roman empire so i think it would be an interesting um interesting game i just don't think anyone's done it yet yeah i'm, I'm going over the screenshots for this game it's actually pretty uh it, it kind of reminds me of uh superpower um uh, with that little bit of a twist to it. Um, But, you know, honestly, you know, we we were supposed to, I I feel like Paradox years ago had the, you know, it was kind of like the pioneer into the, not the pioneer, but I would say, you know, they were bringing the mass culture to the modern day. And the modern day, uh, you know, by doing that, they were bringing out East First West. East First West was supposed to be their first take on a semi-modern day conflict you know you're dealing with vietnam war and korean war and cold war and desert storm and such and i feel like that game would have opened up 
so many possibilities for the company because they could have finished that game and say, all right, you know, let's move on to a modern day conflict, like, you know, uh, you know, the Iraqi war and ISIS and such like that. Um, but, you know, now you, you know, we, we don't have that explosion of, uh, of games uh, that I feel like would have happened if uh, paradox of uh, went down that road. And uh, you have a couple of developers, like the one that you just mentioned, I'm going through some of their screenshots here. Um, Cause I, I, I haven't, I wasn't familiar with powers and revolution and uh, uh, it, it really looks like a, a really uh, cool game. I might have to actually download it and, uh, the actual it looks like it's forty nine ninety nine, so it's uh it's not a it's not a <laughs> if you, yeah, know, they you know they they certainly charge a premium for the game, which is fine if it's a good game, but I think the the knock against them is they've kind of released iteration after iteration. Power and Revolution is the fourth game in that series and, and they have been a little bit buggy and not well polished and maybe not well balanced and I think, you know, if you're gonna charge fifty dollars for a game that comes out every year, you better make sure that it uh that, it, that it, it holds the mustard, and I'm not sure they have. Yeah, I mean, for 499 I expect uh, something that's very uh, stable. I mean, I, I was going through, uh, what was it? Um, I was going through Slytherin's website recently, and, uh, you know, I was I was looking at Afghanistan 11. I believe I saw it for, like, uh, was it a 299 uh, I might be wrong on that, but it was it was incredibly cheap. Uh, I, might have to, I might have to update this, but... Um, I think it was twenty nine nine nine, and I was kind of like surprised. I was like, you know, this is a very well groomed game. It was incredible, and for twenty nine nine nine, it was it was incredible. So for a game like this, uh, for fifty bucks, uh, if I have to spend fifty bucks on a game like this, uh, it better be minimal bugs and offer a lot of replayability uh, in terms of you know. Because I mean, fifty bucks is we're going on a level of a triple A titles, uh, you know, in terms of expenditure uh, on my part. So it's it needs to it needs to hold its weight in terms of uh, what the consumer is going to spend on it. Um, but a couple of cool uh, other cool things. Uh, I, I don't know if you noticed. Uh, you know, I wanted to get your opinion on this because uh, I know you played the PC uh, and uh, the iOS version is on my iPad Air too. I ran into some. Uh, scrolling and zooming issues. So like um, if I put up like a statistics issue on how many troops the U.S. had versus Russia had, and I was kind of like scrolling through it, it would lag considerably. Or if I was zooming in from like, you know, a top down, you know, from like, you know, world out to kind of like a country view and I was uh, pinching and zooming, uh, it would stutter. I mean, below 30 frames per second. And if our audience is not familiar, 30 frames per second is kind of like... Um, it's a fluid view, kind of like if you're pinching and zooming, it's uh, kind of on your iPhone. That's what, uh, like a normal application, like if you go to Google Maps and you're pinching and zooming, that's around 30 to 60 frames per second. So it's very fluid. It's very uh, responsive. When I was playing this game and I was pinching and zooming on like, you know, Europe or Africa or wherever I was, you know, I would pinch out and I'd be like, all right, one, two, three, and then it would, you know, and then it would zoom in. It was just, what's the hold up? Why do I have to wait a couple of seconds? And I've been trying to figure out if it's the engine of the game or if it's my iPad Air 2. Um, so I wanted to know if you're, I know you played the desktop version. Is there that issue with the desktop version? I haven't noticed it, but I have seen some people comment that the game does get a little bit iffy if you're assigning a large number of troops or doing things like that. Ah, Okay. So it might not just be my iPad Air too. Okay, so it might be just the engine of the game. Maybe I'm not. I'm not sure. I was, uh, you know, I was kind of hesitant when I when I saw this uh, kind of when I saw it on you know coming out for the iPad. I was like, you know, I was reading the description. This was a couple of weeks ago. It came out, and I was reading about it, and it said it was a, uh, it was bringing the whole desktop version of it to the iOS, and I was kind of like, okay, so how far is it going to go back to the iPad two, which is from 2011 and that geek bench score. I mean, in terms of horsepower, it's in terms of the geek bench score is very, 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 very slow. So I, I, I wonder which iPads can uh, work on it. And I figured my iPad air two, which was released, I, I think was it, uh, um, I think it was 2015, if I'm not mistaken, or tw- late 2014. Um, 
you know, is a powerful device. And I was just no, I, I was just kind of like surprised that was it was kind of like uh, having issues, uh, especially with like you know going through statistics. I was trying to figure out like, all right, who is the biggest army? Me, China, uh, me as the U.S., China and Russia. And I was like, all right, who can I, you know, who can I tug my belt on, you know? And I was looking, at, I was like, all right, I was trying to like swipe down. I'm like why is this stalling? I'm like, why is this uh, having uh, such a lag to it? And, um, you know, I don't have an iPad pro, so I can't, I can't knock out that like, Hey, it's my iPad air too. I don't know if it's the engine or, but based upon what you're saying, it seems like it's, uh, it's the game, not, not the device. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't know. I haven't played the game enough to, to really get a good sense of, is this stable? Is it buggy or whatnot? I don't want to slander the game saying it's buggy if it's not, um, I just honestly haven't haven't played it enough, and I haven't noticed it being buggy. But again, I haven't played it enough yet. Um, but I guess you know, I think we've kind of probably exhausted the discussion on on this particular game. Uh, kind of moving on to some other topics. I know um, I've been trying to stream a little bit more often. I haven't streamed a ton lately, but I've been trying to stream a little bit more often. And I've, I was kind of curious. I don't see you streaming a whole lot. Is there? Uh, is it just the games that you play? Is it the time that you have? Is it is it your internet connection, maybe? Well, uh, so a couple of things. I mean, you know, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm doing a bunch of things. Uh, recently, I mean, the last two months, I've been going between uh, Norfolk and Brooklyn, like, uh, every week. So, you know, taking an eight, you know, I've been doing an eight-hour drive or probably a 16-hour drive every week uh, uh, between uh, June, July, and August. Uh, so it's been a little bit crazy. Uh, but when I'm I am at home in Norfolk, Virginia. Um, you know, uh, it's been very difficult with the internet connection. I, I don't know if people have been following my uh, Twitter. It's uh, at Strategy Gamer minus the E at the end. Um, you, you'll notice my tweets where I I, uh, I, I little lambast uh, Cox a little bit because uh, I use Cox Internet, uh, Cox Communications, and. Um, I'm not very, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, favorable in terms of their offering. So I pay about $59.99 um, per month for my internet. And for that, I get about 50 megabits, uh, megabits down, not megabytes, megabits down. So roughly I get about like eight megabytes per second. Uh, and I get one, I get two megabits upload speed. Uh, which roughly comes out to uh, a little bit better than 56K. If you guys remember the old 90s internet, I get a little bit better than 56K uploading my videos. Um, so what it comes out to be is like, I, I'll give you a good example. I, I've been uploading my Battlestar Galactica interview with one of uh, with uh, senior, the producer of Battlestar Galactica, Deadlock. And it was a 56 minute, about a 56 minute interview. And I started around like 10 p.m. And I went to sleep, this and that. Woke up the next day, it was like, you know, nine o'clock and did a couple of things, checked my computer at noon. I figured like, dude, it's been over 12 hours. This is done. It's in the pocket. I look at it on my computer and it's 5% done. And I'm like looking at my computer. I'm like, wait, is it my Mac? What? what is it my Mac? I'm like, this, this can't be just be 5% done. It's been on uploading for so many hours. And I did a couple of speed tests and turns out, Cox, you know, you know, originally, you know, I was kind of, uh, I don't know how this happened, but um, even though I was paying for, you know, two megabits upload uh, per month, I somehow they were gracing me with 10 to 15 megabits up. And I never complained because, you know, if, you know, if you get two beers instead of one, you know, at the bar and, you know, the bartender's like, here, this beers on the house you know you're not going to complain you know forget about it you know so i i uh i you know i never voiced the concern unfortunately something happened and it reduced down so i'm at the point where i'm kind of like perplexed in terms of my internet needs um and i did some research try to figure out all right cox is offering a really abysmal package for 60 dollars because t-mobile which i currently use for forty dollars, I get about ten to twenty megabits up, so I can get a, a video up in like an hour or two. So I'm like, all right, let me look, look. Let me look around for something that's not cellular, something that's uh, hardline. There isn't. 
Cox has to deal with my city, just like my my family in Brooklyn. Uh, when I when I go up to Brooklyn for half the year. Um, By the way, I'm running speed have... tests the whole time while you're talking about this. <laughs> because i mean it's ridiculous I mean, you know i i you were sending me some speed test results be, uh, before we started the podcast i was like holy shit and, you know i was just kind of like <sighs> it's a little frack. bit slower for me right now just given that i'm uh I'm even stream, you know i'm streaming but all right, all right. so let, let's do let, let's do an actual uh all right so i did one right before we started the podcast here all right, so I want to release my findings compared to your findings. So, all right, I'm going on my iPhone here, and uh, I'm going to release my findings for what I just did before the podcast. So on Wi-Fi, right, download speeds, I got about 30 megabits down, right? Uh, and this is going to be really bad. 0.73 upload speeds, right? Uh, now, for the traditional user, if you're not familiar, um, you just need about like eight or nine megabits down to get really HD on your Netflix, right? 30 is really good, right? Um, 0.73, if you're trying to upload something, like for example, if you just took a video of your family at a wedding or whatever, and you're trying to upload to YouTube or Dropbox or whatever, 0.73 means if you started now, by the time your kids graduate college, that's when it's going to be done. It's gonna be a while. Um, so that's my Wi-Fi speeds for Cox. Now, right after you told me your speeds, I did a cellular speed with T-Mobile. Now, T-Mobile in this area obviously has to compete with AT and T, Verizon, Sprint, all the uh, all the rest of them. And now I'm on T-Mobile, right? So I got 12 megabits down. So Netflix, no problem. Forget about it. And uh, upload speeds. Now check this out. 18 megabits up. So meaning if I wanted to, you know, go to a wedding and I went to see, which I recently did to my cousin, and I wanted to take the whole wedding and it was three hours. And I wanted to upload it to my entire family. It would take me not hours. We're talking about minutes. We're talking about like 30 minutes. I can get the whole video up and then it's my mom, dad, whoever. Now with Cox, it would take me months now, the thing about it is, is with Cox, I'm paying $60 a month. With T-Mobile, their package for unlimited speeds is about $40. So the thing that I, I wanted to kind of bring up uh, with you is this comes down to the, I don't know, and I don't want to get too political because I know some people are on different sides of the aisle. So I want to bring up net neutrality because this goes to the heart of net neutrality. Net neutrality deals with like, um, competition and it and deals with uh, should ISPs, internet service providers, your internet service provider, whoever you're using, should they be treated in terms of um, hands off in terms of regulation or hands on? And uh, in my opinion, and I know I'm probably going to get some flack for this, I think they should be treated hands on uh, because a good example is Cox is in my area, they have no competition. Paying six dollars a month, I get abysmal speeds, and they're locked into the city, so I'm never going to get any better speeds because there's no competition. Um, Cox can just leave it as is because it's either you take it or you leave it. Um, now, with net neutrality, Title II being implemented, uh, the government can say, "Look, I understand you have no competition. I understand you have uh, deals with, in, you know, cities and such like that." But you have to maintain a certain standard of living for your customers. And yeah, but the broadband, the, com- the definition of broadband, according to the government, is three megabits a second anyway. So <sighs> down or up? Down. <coughs> so it, this really wow. isn't this serious? really isn't a net neutrality issue, to be honest. Net neutrality is more of, you know, the they can't prioritize certain traffic over others. So, for example, theoretically, Verizon shouldn't be able to prioritize Netflix over YouTube, uh, because then what you know what companies would like to do is they'd like to be able to turn around and say, "Okay, Google, okay, Netflix, okay, Joe Schmo's video streaming service that you just started up, you all have to pay us a million dollars a year in order to get priority access." 
Netflix and YouTube will say, okay, well, we don't really want to do it, but whatever, we need to do it to be able to compete. Joe Schmo's video service won't be able to afford it. Therefore, anyone who goes to use Joe Schmo's video service will have a crappy experience and they'll say, well, screw this. I'm just going to go watch this on YouTube. And there you go. There's no innovation. There's no change. Startups have a really hard time competing against, you know, multi-billion dollar companies that can can afford to be basically shook down by internet service providers uh, for, you know, their service. The idea is, think about your utility. Should you be billed for your electric bill? But then should the electric company be able to turn around and charge your washing machine company in order to actually, you know, work? So, like, if you buy your washing machine, but your washing machine doesn't pay some fee to the electric company, I know this isn't really possible, but should the electric company be able to make your washing machine perform poorly just because they didn't pay them? And now you, the consumer who bought this washing machine, are suffering because the the provider of the product didn't pay the electric company for better service. That that is more what the heart of net neutrality is about. Um, you know, the actual internet speeds, that's a whole separate ball game, which I agree with you is is a mess and it's a nightmare uh, for a lot of people out there. Um, but it's it's I don't I don't think, and I'm not a lawyer, so I could be wrong, but I don't think it comes down to net neutrality. I think it just comes down to the fact that a lot of these, like Cox, to your, your example, a lot of these companies sign deals with municipalities to say, we'll, be, we'll only invest in your city. We'll only build an internet network in your city if you sign a deal with us that says we get exclusive access to your city and no one else is allowed to come in here. And the problem is, I don't think a lot of those deals had end dates. I think a lot of those deals were, if not short-term, very long-term contracts were 20, 30, 40, 50 years or more uh, where they get to be the exclusive internet provider of a given community. And now they have literally no reason to invest in providing anything but the most bare bones of experiences for internet other than the fact that they have to meet certain government regulations around what is classified as a broadband provider so they can, you know, stay within the terms of their agreement. But the problem is what the government classifies is driven by the lowest common denominator of this community, you know, three megabits a second might be a godsend to someone in the middle of nowhere in Arkansas where there literally is nothing except maybe like inner, like t- uh, phone lines. So if you could get them that, they'd be happy. But the problem is like this universal treatment means that most people just kind of get, you know, in more populated areas kind of get screwed over. And I, I completely agree. I mean, I, I feel like honestly that with, you know, when you, when you don't have any competition in a certain area, you know, it, whoever is running the monopoly, because honestly right now Cox is running monopoly in my little city, uh, Norfolk. And uh, when I'm in Brooklyn for half the year, um, it's, uh, you know, I, I think it's uh, Verizon right now um, uh, that, uh, that my uh, family's paying for. Um, so they're running a monopoly in that in a certain area. And when you decide, well, look, your service sucks. I mean, it's completely abysmal. You really don't have anybody to turn to. And I feel like if there's no competition, you know, it, it comes down to what, like, you know, um, Teddy Roosevelt did back in, you know, the uh, early 20th century, where it was just like, all right, well, you're running a monopoly here. This is not going to fly. We're either going to bust you up or, you know, we're going to have to set up certain, rec- uh, you know, uh, regulations to kind of guide you, whether, you know, it be like, you know, I'm fine with paying, you know, I understand, you know, some people are not like me, 30 megabits down and less than one megabit upload uh maybe some people are fine with that you know that works for some people you know if you're an average user all you do is play netflix today or you go on facebook whatever that's fine at that speeds you know it should be 20 to 30 dollars a month to be honest as a you know person who's been around since the beginning of the internet you know i've i've been you know at internet 1.0 when you know you had windows 95 and the internet was just the infancy uh in terms for the consumer at this day and age what i in terms of the speed that i get 20 to 30 dollars is what i i feel like i should pay for it um not 60 dollars um and i feel like because there's no competition it's like yeah six dollars we're just gonna do the 60 dollars I feel if there was competition or some government regulation um, that at the current price I'm paying for, if there was competition or some government regulation, 
I would probably get something closer to maybe 30 megabits up and maybe 50 or 60 megabits or maybe even higher in terms of download speeds. Um, maybe, but you wouldn't it, get it for 20 or 30 bucks a month. Oh, and yeah, for those speeds, no, I wouldn't get it for 20 I mean, I guess I, I, I hesitate to say government regulation, and again, without getting too political, what I was trying to get across earlier is there are government regulations in place that say you have to provide X speed in order to be classified as broadband, which gets into the, those companies receiving subsidies for building out in rural areas and things like that. But but there are government regulations in place. I think the issue is the regulations are insufficient. Um, with that being said, I think competition is probably the way to go. I live in the Chicago area, and um, you know, not that long ago uh, when we moved here, uh, we had Xfinity, uh, Comcast as an option, and we had AT&T as an option. I think we had like 50 down and 5 up was kind of what we had, what we paid for. Oh, it was wow. like 60 or $70 a month. Um, okay. And shortly thereafter, Google announced that they were looking, and this was before they kind of gave up on Google Fiber, but Google had announced that they were looking at Chicago as a market to bring Google Fiber to. Oh, Wow. And before uh, they were investigating it, they hadn't said it was for sure coming. And I want to say within like a month, uh, Xfinity slash Comcast had been offering a, a gigabit internet speed. So something to, you know, they had already been offering this in a couple other markets, you know, thousand megabits down. I want to say it's 50 up. So it's not symmetrical. It's not thousand down, thousand up, but it was a thousand down, 50 up. And they had been offering this in multiple different markets. It was kind of expensive. They had been offering it in Chicago as well. It was like $150 a month for the service. But as soon as Google announced that they were considering Chicago, they immediately offered $70 a month for 1000 down, 50 up, on a three-year contract. So basically what they were trying to say was, we'll give you this really good price, which matched what Google Fiber was. We'll lock you in for three years. And then if Google does come, we're safe because one, you're under contract. And two, we're offering a competitive, you know, speed and price. And, you know, Google Fiber is still better for that price, given they have a thousand down, a thousand up. Uh, but but nonetheless, it was it was a compelling offer. We immediately signed up for it and, and I'm loving the experience and it's it's at a great price. Shortly thereafter, Google announced that they were were more or less giving up on Google Fiber. And um, since then, that promotional price has gone away, and I want to say it's like $130 a month if you want to get the same plan we're paying 74 for right now. So, you know, I, I agree with you. I think competition is, is where it's at. I think that the challenge is the many of the regulations were built to try and create an Internet infrastructure in markets that are not, you know, 10 million people like Chicago. They were built to try and make it affordable for uh, cable companies to build internet service in the middle of nowhere. And it's an incredibly expensive proposition if you want to build a internet, you know, fiber optic line where you've got a community of like 100 people. It's going to take you years, if not decades, to recoup the cost to to install that service. So that's, unfortunately, that's why you're stuck paying what you're paying is one, there's no competition, and two, you know, Cox operates in more rural markets. They don't operate in a ton of big cities. I know a little bit about the industry, and I know they operate in a lot of areas that are not, you know, they don't operate in Chicago. They don't operate in Milwaukee. They don't operate in, in larger cities, to my my understanding anyway. Maybe some, some larger cities, but that's not their principal market. So they probably have very high CapEx costs to build their network out in areas that, you know, they don't get a ton of money back. And... You know, to this day, the government has much more heavily subsidized cellular uh, development. So they give a lot of money to companies like T-Mobile and Verizon and AT&T when they build a tower in the middle of nowhere. They give far less money to cable providers. So Cox is kind of stuck in this, not to play devil, you know, kind of playing devil's advocate on the side of the, the ISP. Cox is kind of stuck in this situation where they need to get as much as they can out of the customers they have in order to be able to support the the lesser population density areas that they, they operate in. So, again, you're right. They could probably afford to offer it to you for $30 or $40 a month at your current speeds, uh, but it might hurt their ability to offer it to someone living in a community of, like, 15 people. But, you know, I mean, yeah, I agree with you. I mean, I uh, 
you know, I, I completely agree with you in terms of, uh, in terms of expenses and stuff like that. But when it comes down to, so a couple of things that the ISPs over the years have done that kind of always made me hesitant to trust them is, uh, so back when I was working at, um, uh, I want to mention, uh, I mean, if previous listeners will know, but everybody knows uh, you worked for Apple, it's all good. Yeah. So I don't want to bring this up too much because I, I might, uh, I might. Well, don't say anything might, you don't want to say. My my, yeah, my only point is that I, I yeah. certainly understand that that ISPs have done shady things. There's no doubt about that. There's examples of providers throttling companies' internet, even though like it was violating net neutrality when it when it was in force. Um, they certainly do a lot of shady things. My only point is that um, you know it's it's challenging when you have a country the size of the United States to gain the advantages of, of technology at a, at a efficient cost. Um, you know, uh, cellular providers, I'll use them as examples. Cellular providers operate networks of thousands to tens of thousands of cell towers. Every one they put up costs them more than a million dollars. Just think about that. Every single cellular site they put up costs them more than a million dollars. And that's just to build a tower. So if you're paying your cell phone company 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 dollars a month, they've got to provide you the service, which isn't free, and they've got to support the infrastructure costs that they have. So again, it's it's just it's a challenging industry to fully wrap your head around and, and fully understand. Um I think the other interesting piece is like just a sort of my warning to you. If you want to go with T-Mobile for their unlimited plan and they're providing better service, great, do it. But realize they, they'll throttle you for your hotspot once you use more than 30 gigabytes a month. So they say it's unlimited, but they're going to slow your hotspot speeds basically down to, to nothing if you exceed more than 30 gigabytes a month using your hotspot. You know, I mean, like, when I, when I was in the industry, when I was, um, like you were saying, you know, so when I was working for Apple, I, I used to talk to, like, Verizon, AT&T, uh, Sprint, and T-Mobile, and, uh, and uh, and Cox and, and numerous other uh, companies and stuff like that. And, uh, um, you know, I'm not talking about on duty and like off duty, like we were bullshit in, in, in a bar or something like that. And we, I, you know, the one thing I always ask them, like, so I'm just kind of curious, like, and, you know, I would do these speed tests before when I lived in Staten Island or Brooklyn or wherever I was. And I always noticed that like, so if I was on Verizon, I would do a speed test. I was on Cox, I would do a speed test. I'm like, why is it? I'm just kind of curious. Well, like I just did a speed test, right? Why am I paying, you know, $50 for uh, T-Mobile or Verizon at that time? Um, And I'm paying you guys $80 for internet service and I'm getting less than that. And they would always say, well, we have to do construction costs and have to do, we have to do this. And I was like, I understand you guys have to do this. And I understand, you know, the, the, cellular carriers might be subsidized a little bit more. Um, but are you telling me you're charging 20 or $30 more per customer because you got to tear up the ground a little bit, you know, you got to tear up the ground versus putting up towers. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, a, it's for me, it's hard to believe Cox is charging me uh, at that time. Uh, this was years ago, uh, 20 or $30 more. Um, Versus a Verizon that was charging me fifty or sixty dollars, and I was getting better service with Verizon in terms of data speeds than I was getting with uh, Cox. Now I, I understand if you you know they, you know a lot of carriers will throttle you and stuff like that um, after a certain amount of data, um, but I always just get very surprised by because all the carriers need to do is literally lay down the actual fiber, the actual tube that goes to your house. Um, and then basically in terms of maintenance, they just have to send a, you know, some guy out, a technician to make sure everything's working at the, uh, at the, um, uh, I forgot the name uh, that they were uh, mentioning when I was there, but at the little uh, junction point where, you know, all the cables meet up and just make sure everything is good to go. It's a central point. Um, 
versus the guys that are running in a carriage, which have to deal with a lot of, uh, you know, I, I noticed a lot of people that will run into a Verizon Sprint and AT&T, they're dealing with a lot more issues in terms of uh, frequencies, uh, in terms of what carrier frequencies they have to deal with, uh, the low range, the high range, um, in terms of uh, setting up towers and places, because a good example is like you're in Midtown Manhattan. A lot of people used to complain, but like, why is uh, signal so bad in Midtown Manhattan? 40 seconds. Why am I getting like one bar here? Well, the problem is, was, you know, the carrier guys, uh, you know, I don't know if I, I maybe I should not be saying this, but they were always telling me they were like, well, the reason why is because a lot of people didn't want to, you know, uh, put towers on top of their buildings and we would have to pay them uh large sums of money to just put towers on top of their buildings to cover people in Times Square, wherever. Um, so I always felt like the carriers always had the harder, much more difficult task of reaching out to their customers, be, but also being able to provide a lower price versus the ISPs like Cox or Time Warner or whoever, who just had to dig up the road, put a, ta- uh, a wire, you know, a tube, whatever, uh, the, uh, you know, fiber optic cable to your house. Yes and, and no. I mean, it, it goes both ways. So carriers have a challenge in that they've got to put up a whole bunch of towers, you know, in in a, in a certain number of locations in a given geographic area. So that's certainly expensive. Buying licenses to put a tower in someone's building, that's definitely expensive. But they also have the great joy of not having to go door to door. They don't have to put a wire to every single home. They don't have to put a wire to every single building. They put one tower up every, you know, five to ten square miles and then they're good. A... A uh, landline internet provider or cable provider has to physically dig up the ground, sure, but they've got to put that in every single building. They can't skip five miles. They can't skip three miles. They can't skip a mile. They've got to run a cable to every single building. They've got to wire every single building to have this this service. So the costs are different. I don't know enough to know which is, is more or, or less. Um, I mean, they're both very complex industries, but, but they're certainly, and again, I, I don't work for a landline internet provider i'm not trying to you know say why why they're they're great i i just would hesitate to say it's more or less expensive i honestly don't know i just hope the uh the price i mean like either oh, have- uh, one other thing is i would also say that landline internet providers do also set up their own uh, towers in certain places so in like more rural markets the way they in certain circumstances the way they link uh, you to their core network is via microwave so they'll have a base station that that broadcasts between two different base stations so you might have a cable that goes to this one centralized location and it links up like a thousand homes all of that internet feeds into this sort of base station and then that base station will be linked via microwave frequencies with another location which links them into like their central hub their their internet backbone so in some cases they have to do both uh, because it's actually cheaper in the, in some cases for them to have a station that broadcasts a frequency to another station than it is to to lay a line across a mountain or something like. That. Oh wow! I didn't, yeah, I wasn't familiar with that. Oh, interesting. So I mean, again, if they're doing that and it's cheaper for them to to have a you know a tower broadcasting something to another location than it is to lay a wire, that tells me it's probably not cheap. But but I don't know. Um, I just, you know, there's there's pros and cons of both. Uh, I've certainly been there where I've been incredibly frustrated with my internet provider when I was in Wisconsin. There just weren't any options. It was, you know, the fastest internet option you had was 50 megabits. And this was, you know, when Google Fiber was coming out and everyone in Chicago could get much better than that. And I'm stuck in Wisconsin with like 50 down. And, you know, I, I'm just wondering why the hell I don't have better options. I certainly think there needs to be more competition. I think that would definitely help. But I also don't. Um, you know, I, I don't, I can't say I've looked through the financials to know how much of my, you know, $70 a month plan, uh, does it take for me to be profitable for them? What are their margins at? You know, I, I haven't looked at that enough. It does seem to me that most of the larger companies do very well financially. So, cause they, could they charge less? Probably. But, um, you know, I don't know. There are other things they have to think about, like internet or uh, cellular providers. They just built out their networks to 4G LTE, and and already they're starting to try and figure out what is 5G going to look like, and they're going to have to go and spend billions of dollars there building that stuff out. So, 
you know, just as you get done with one technological development that should make it possible for you to sell stuff really inexpensively to people, now you've got to pay for another one that's going to, you know, do the same thing. You're kind of caught in this never-ending cycle of upgrades. Right now, a lot of landline providers are starting to upgrade to Fiber or, or Docs 3.1, which allows you to get, like, Fiber-like speeds on a coaxial cable. Um, but that's not a cheap investment. You know, that's not a cheap investment. That's That's billions of dollars right there. So... You know, uh, do they operate in ways that I wish they didn't a lot of times? Yeah. Uh, do do inter, do landline providers, could they be uh, kept more honest if they had to compete more more often with each other? Sure, there's no doubt about that. Um, but I'm not sold that a, a regulation is going to do it or, or what have you. I think your best hope is competition. But I still think there's going to be people that are going to be left behind when you have that because there's going to be people... You're in a community of 25 or, you know, let's say you're in a community of 100 homes and you're in the middle of Oklahoma and you're 100 miles away from the nearest large city and you've got one internet provider already that has a monopoly. That law goes away saying that there's no more monopoly. Do you really think AT&T or Verizon or Comcast or uh, Charter, uh, who, who bought out Time Warner, are any of them really going to spend, let's say it costs them $5 million to, to build out to that town. Are they going to do that for getting a small percentage of 100 people? Probably not. Um, so I think you're always going to have an issue where, you know, now that, now that the markets have been set and that monopolies exist in many of these locations, um, as much as I would say just get rid of those monopolies, I don't know if that's going to do anything. I think the real hope for landline internet is the increasing evolution of cellular technology will maybe allow cell phone providers in in these areas to truly compete with landline internet. And to this point, they really haven't been able to. Even today, LTE service, you know, even the truly, quote-unquote, truly unlimited plans are limited at a point. Um, T-Mobile's not going to let you use 300 gigabytes of internet in a month. (laughs) <laughs> I wish they're not, but they're not going to. I mean, again, their hotspot terms and conditions say they will throttle you after 32 gigabytes. So they say they're unlimited, but there are certain t- conditions in there. And I, you know, I just in my uh, Battlestar Galactica uh, interview, uh, which I'm planning to publish tomorrow, um, I'm planning. I, I uploaded it, and it said I I used 100 percent of my hotspot. So I flipped over. I said, you know what? They said. 100% of my hotspot, but what if I could put the video on my iPhone and upload the video from my iPhone, which I did, um, and I got another six gigs, six gigabytes of data uploaded. But, um, but sure, yeah, at some online. point, at some point in their terms and conditions, I don't know if there's a set amount because they advertise yeah. it as as unlimited. Yeah, but imagine. at some point, they're going to limit your speed, saying that you're preventing them from having optimal network performance. So, like LTE has gone a long way to allow cell phone providers to start competing, as you're showing with landline internet providers. But at the end of the day, you know, I think if 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 you follow the industry at all, I don't know if you do. The real hope for that, the real hope for internet to home for cell phones providers is coming with 5g and when 5g comes out uh the speed benefits are less are less clear than the sort of network performance benefits i don't know if it's going to be one of those things that you're going to market directly to consumers saying like this is the greatest new thing it's super fast like there's there's advanced lte work that can be done to make internet almost like uh, gigabit speeds anyway um and that'll end up becoming available anyway with 5g also but really, I think for the providers, the benefit is going to be allowing them to have a greater volume pushed out over their limited broadcasting frequencies that, that may allow them to compete more effic- effectively with landline internet providers. And if that becomes the case, if if cellular providers can replace landline internet providers, then that, that may be the ball game for a lot of those those providers. And I think that's why you see like Comcast and Charter trying to start to get into the wireless game because they know they need they need a they need a play there. But you know the the thing about the um, 5G was uh, I was uh, I was uh, in uh, New York uh, a couple weeks ago and I was uh, I uh, went for a special event. Or I don't know most of our listeners probably don't uh, listen to this, but um, uh, I would uh, I listen to uh, uh, Control uh, uh, Alt uh, no Control Walt. Uh, what is it? Control, alt, 
Mossberg, I think, whatever it was, it's a, it's a Verge, uh, a Verge, uh, dot com, uh, podcast. And, um, it's basically between uh, Neelai Patel and Walt Mossberg, who just recently retired from uh, the industry. And I got, I got a chance to go to one of their events and uh, bullshit with them a little bit. And uh, I was I was asking them about like the future of 5G, uh, because when I was in the industry, we were, we were always talking about it. And um, I got to talk to some people that were in Europe and U.S. And, uh, and there's a lot of stuff to the way we, you know, uh, title 4G and 5G. Apparently, uh, the way the international standard is, is we're always a step back. So, you know, our 3G is the world's 3.5G. Our 4G is the world's like 5G. So when we call 5G is, you know, the world's 6G, you know, and uh, from the from what I've been told. And when I was uh, bullshitting with like Walt Mossberg and uh, uh, Nilay Patel and uh, Dieter Bone, which was funny guy i i really i i always thought he was uh he was hilarious and i was meeting him and his wife um we were always talking about like the future of the internet and you know we were talking about like carriers versus uh internet service providers like you know cox and such like that and um i i was you know while we we're talking about it we were always just wondering like what the speeds of 5 G would be because I mean honestly our phones right now can get us Netflix can get us Hulu uh, can get us Amazon Prime and you know basically everything we want on 4G LTE which pretty much everybody listening to this has 4G LTE on their phones uh, hopefully <laughs> um, and you can get your Netflix and get your Hulu fix and everything like that um, the ma- but you know the small major minority of us like me. Uh, Matt uh, and you know a bunch of others who need higher speeds to upload, you know, to YouTube and stuff like that. Require need five G. Five uh, G would encompass speeds of like uh, one to ten gigabits per second. So basically, what I'm saying is like if you're a normal person, if you wanted, it, if you took a video recording of a wedding and it was like two three hours worth, and you wanted to send it to your mom and you know sister whoever. And instead of waiting the 30 minutes or two, three hours that it would normally take, it would take you literally 20 seconds to send it to them. It would literally just click your mom's name, click send, and there it goes. Um, that's what 5G is. Um, the only problem is those speeds have never been set. Like from what I've been understanding from when I, when I was talking to them, they were like, they were telling me that the councils that determine what the speeds of 5G are still like – are out, you know, out to lunch. They're still trying to figure out like, where's 5G begin and where's 4G end. And I feel like if honestly, you know, like uh, if one of the carriers, um, if any of the carriers get 5G, I feel like honestly, based upon the theoretical speeds of it, honestly, if 5G comes, I can probably just dump Cox and say, you know, hello, T-Mobile. Uh, I not, want you. 5G over. isn't, I don't think the, the, Use case is kind of what what you would generally say. I don't think the 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 value prop of five G is its speed. Um, it'll be a piece to it, but it's not like four G was all about speed. Four G was you know three G is like oh you can watch some video it buffers all the time it's a crappy experience. Four G the reason that you the reason that you could sell four G to everybody was you could say now you can watch Netflix on your phone on your tablet on your whatever and there's no issue it all works. What 5G will end up being it, it, at the moment, and it hasn't, to your point, it hasn't been fully defined yet. Um, I don't, I don't think they've aligned on what the technology is yet either. But what 5G will end up being is more about the ability for a network to handle dramatically greater stress and dramatically greater. Uh, volume of of data being used it will not be as clear to the customer why they're signing up for it except that the technology will theoretically uh, allow dramatically higher amounts of data to be transferred across the same limited spectrum uh, that that a cellular provider works with so ideally 
you are able to say, well, we have a 20 gig, it's a silent cap. Like, you know, we say unlimited, but after 20 gigabytes of data, you end up getting, getting used, you know, you getting slowed down. And what 5G will end up allowing them to say as well, for the same price, you know, at roughly the same speeds, maybe an increase in speed. Sure, maybe it's a gigabit a second, but that's not what the customer cares about. They'll be able to say, nope, you don't get throttled till 300 gigabytes. You don't get throttled till 500 gigabytes. I'm just making those numbers up. I'm just saying that the real thing that I think a lot of providers are looking at is when it comes to 5G, it allows a whole different group of devices in use cases to be looked at, it allows them to really jump on the M to M, the IOT world, where they don't have to worry about sh- huge numbers of of data coming at them and needing to build a whole bunch of new towers and spending billions of dollars for only an incremental gain. Uh, what they really see there is they see the ability for the network to take on a whole lot more traffic at marginal cost increases and allow them to service their customers in ways they've never been able to do before. And I think depending on how that all shakes out, that could allow them to compete with a landline provider because sure, maybe your speeds are better on the 5G, but that's not why you're really signing up for it. You're signing up for it because the speeds are at least equal to the landline provider, but now you don't have to worry about bandwidth caps. So now the now the one thing that really helped Cox say like, well, we're better because we don't throttle you after 20 gigs. If that becomes 500 gigabytes, look out, Cox. Your your business model's in trouble. No, hopefully that happens because I definitely need a... But it's still a ways away. I mean, again, they haven't even defined the standards yet, so we're probably not talking mass adoption of of 5G for at least two, maybe three more years. You see every once in a while, like, a provider will say, like, oh, we're trialing it here, or we're doing this. But, like, the actual wide-scale implementation where they define what it is, they build it out, they get customers to sign up for it, they get OEMs like Apple to build devices for it, like, that all takes time. The the four G spectrum yeah. auctions the four G spectrum auctions took place in two thousand eight. They didn't end up really rolling LTE out for four plus years after that. Yeah, and you know, I mean, Apple's always, uh, you know, from the from the people I talked to and when I was in, um, you know, it's always uh, I'm re- I don't know if you guys remember uh, a lot of our listeners. I don't know if you guys pick up the first iPhone, but the first iPhone when it first came out was two G, uh, and the three G network was was there it wasn't as matured yet and um i don't know if you guys ever you know watched the first steve jobs uh introduction of the iphone but you know he showed the way 2g worked and you know he load up a website and took you know like you know 20 to 30 seconds for like the new york times to load up versus compared to like one second today uh, but uh 5g in 10 years uh, since the intro- introduction of the first iPhone. Um, we're at the beginning of the 5G. I mean, considering that it would take 30 seconds back then, it would take milliseconds now. I mean, literally, you click New York Times with, you know, 5G um, frequency, which would be, you know, uh, I mean, we're looking at like, what, one or two gigabit uh, gigabits down uh, would take a fraction of a second. And, uh, you know, most people want to notice it. I think me and you would notice it, uh, uh, advanced people who are, um, uh, you know, in terms of like, uh, video uploading and, and in terms of like, uh, constantly being on speedtest.net, <laughs> you know, benchmarking our, uh, our, our, our connection on every connect, uh, on every Wi-Fi that we get. Uh, but the traditional user, I don't think they would ever, do you think would, they would ever notice that uh, 5G difference? Maybe. Um, I think it's it's hard to really know um, until we know what technology looks like in five, ten years. I mean, you never would have imagined needing the amount of data you need on your cell phone before HDTVs were prevalent. You never would have known, you know, so, so what is 4K going to do? That's going to put a ton of additional strain on... Um, you know, on on what's going on. So it's I, I don't know yet. Yeah, four K is definitely uh, the uh, is definitely going to be a big deciding factor, uh, especially uh, from I don't want to. So I guess I'm, uh, anyway. So I'll just say it. I mean, 
so based upon the people I talked to, 4K is going to be a big issue this fall. Uh, and it's going to turn a lot of heads. And hopefully... Um, a lot of people I said that buy- about 3D TVs and those things died out. You know, I, I honestly, you know, I knew 4K was going to be the biggest thing. You know, like uh, from the people I talked to at... Uh, actually, I was at I was working at Apple at the time when uh, uh, 3D TV was coming out. And um, we were always bullshit with people at like Google and Microsoft. And uh, I, I knew from the fact by just bullshitting with them and like having beers with them. Um, I was like, you know... I don't think this 3D TV is going to work out. And a lot of them were always like, yeah, I don't, you know, that's not going to be the future. Um, and when 4K came around and 8K was being talked about, uh, a lot of them started turning their heads and, uh, you know, they got very hush hush. And I'm like, oh, so you're probably working on a project, aren't you? And they're like, yeah, we're, yeah, let's just, let's get another round or whatever, maybe. Um so at that point, I was like, okay, 4K is probably going to be a thing because apparently if they're not talking about it, they're on a project about involving 4K. So I'm just thinking I'm always uh, that 4K is going to be a big thing, which reminds me, you know, which makes me think I have to buy a new TV that involves 4K because I'm old. my TV right now only involves uh, 1080p. But the one thing I wanted to ask you, uh, and I'm, I'm trying to like uh, jump ship here a little bit, uh, before our podcast ends, I want to ask you a little bit about, so I know you have an iPhone. So I don't, I, I'm not sure if you have an iPad. I, 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 you might've mentioned it before, but I'm not, I'm not sure. iOS 11 is coming out next month and, uh, and Apple hasn't released a final, um, uh, anticipation date for y'all people, but, um, uh, maybe I shouldn't, uh, but anyway, um, traditionally if you look back throughout the years it's always going to be fall of uh 2011 and generally that's around the same time as the new iphone that comes out it's generally september um and i will ios 11 uh if all the people i've talked to have mentioned that ios 11 stops 32-bit support for games now if you're not a tech junkie uh that basically means um there's two types of when you start an application whether it's on your computer on your iphone or your ipad or whatever maybe there's a couple the application the game that you're running is either a 64-bit or a 32-bit application and generally basically what that means is a 64-bit application can uh, consume more data in essence it can run better graphics, can handle more stuff. Like, for example, if you're playing Hearts of Iron, it can handle more countries versus less countries. I mean, that's probably the best explanation I can do. Um, So iOS 11 is killing out all 32-bit applications. Um, And this is a big thing because games like uh and i'm gonna just gonna name a couple of games like uh Sl- slytherine's legion great battles uh medieval battle academy 2 commander of the great war which i love on my ipad i just want to point that out right there and other games like uh pike and shot are all 32-bit applications and uh, i want to ask you matt uh how you felt about this huge transition because this is a big transition i mean a lot of developers make games for ios and i don't know how i feel about this uh and i can't release an opinion until probably the week after the the coming week but um i i wanted to get your opinion on how you felt about this because i don't know it, it's it's a big it's, it's big in the new i i mean at least for me it's big I don't know. I haven't really. I don't play many games on my phone or on my my tablet. To be honest, I played um, was it Legion? I think I reviewed Legion for the Wargamer dot com like years ago. Um, but in general, I don't don't play a ton of them. Um, by the way, I just did a speed test on my Verizon uh, on my Verizon phone, and I got one hundred and one megabits down and fifteen up. Um, one hundred and one, really? Yeah. Anyway, um. So, so basically, uh, what I'm trying to say is, you could run basically ten Netflix uh, streams at HD, and not even you know bat an eye. 
Yeah, well, I don't know if the speed is necessarily equivalent to the bandwidth, right? So, like, how quickly you download something doesn't mean that's how wide your pipe is. Um, but but anyway, um, I I don't know. I don't play a lot of games on my tablet or on my phone. I guess it's bad for the strategy gaming community in general because the more options you have, kind of the better. Um, I'm curious if it'll end up clearing out some of the crap that's on the marketplace. I, I'm, I'm really... It'll be a really interesting. Um, it'll be interesting to see how that all shakes out. Like I don't know how difficult it would be to recode those games into sixty-four bit. You know, maybe it's something that they can do um, easily. Uh, but I guess we'll see. I think it's it's kind of a watch point. It's kind of curious and, and kind of concerning going forward. But I don't have a good sense of what what I should really think. Sorry to not have not have it. an opinion. I, I just don't know. I mean, I I think it could be good, it could be bad, but I guess we'll see what happens. If if that even happens. They haven't actually announced it yet, have they? Um well I get you know, based upon the source that I have, I mean it's pretty much ninety nine percent that it's 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 gonna happen that uh thirty two bit applications are gonna be started uh not be supported by OS eleven and you know, majority of our listeners are are going to have to go to iOS 11, and I completely encourage everybody listening to go to iOS 11, primarily because, you know, not only is it going to give you great features, but might as one I want to include here is video recording, which basically means you can video record everything on your iPhone and iPad, which is something I've been... Um, You're uh, talking about, like, capturing your screen. Yes, and I've been kind of pushing that when I was at Apple uh, for years, uh, and I'm so thankful that it's finally came out because I have to use a, you know, for me to get it right now, I have to use a third-party application on my Mac, but to do it straight from my iPhone and my iPad, where you could just screen capture everything you're doing on your iPhone or iPad with iOS 11 is is amazing. Uh, so I'm a very big proponent of that. Uh, and, uh, to everybody at Coop who did that, um, thank you. Um, <laughs> and I'm sorry that you got, you know, I a lot of emails for that, but, um, thank you. Uh, but anyway, um, the thing that I'm worried about is, uh, you know, there's some great games that Slytherin came out with, which is like Command of the Great War. Uh, Battle Academy is a great game. I love that. Uh, and, you know, uh, Slytherin's Legion uh, is another great game. Uh, and, and, you know, a bunch of other ones like Pike, Pike and Shot is a great game. Um, and I was looking at Touch Arcade and they were saying how to redo the games to a 64-bit, which would require a lot of work, uh, is much more likely that it's not going to happen is, you know, I was kind of worried about that because, uh, you know, you're probably familiar, you know, I'm a big iPad and iPhone person, you know, a lot of times I'm, I'm very mobile. I'm always on the go and, you know, either I'm, you know, hanging out with, uh, this person there, or I'm at a bar with, uh, this manager there and chilling with this, uh, you know, I was just at, at a bar a couple hours ago with, uh, um, that, you know, uh, one of my friends and I love being able to play all these apps, you know, on my iPhone or iPad. And I feel like when we move to 64 bit and all these apps go away, um, I feel it's going to be very limiting, especially command of the great war. I, I can't tell you how many hours I've sunk into that game. I've played that game more on my iPad than I've played on my desktop. And um, I've got a few friends who played that a lot. I mean, it, it would be unfortunate if it didn't get carried over. I guess we'll end up seeing what happens. Personally, it doesn't affect me a ton. I mean, I know we run a strategy game podcast, and it's kind of like, all right, I should really care. I have a hard time caring. I, I don't. I, I guess I don't really play games on my phone all that often, uh, which is kind of funny because I play them on my computer all the time. Like, if I'm out and about, I'm rarely on my phone for anything, but maybe like, oh, what a, a browsing the internet or. Um, you know, listening to music or something. I'm not going to play a game in a bar or, or, or anything like that. But that's just me personally. Uh, I, I'm concerned from the standpoint of I don't want to limit the number of options that, that the community has in terms of, like, how many strategy games you you have available to you. 
Uh, on the flip side, there's plenty of crap out there that I wouldn't mind getting filtered out, and I wonder, wonder if this is just sort of Apple's way of saying, like, all right, you're either serious about this or you're not, and we're gonna, you know, we're gonna kind of do a purge here. Um, but I guess we'll see. I mean, I, it's concerning, but um, I guess I'll just leave it at that. I guess we'll see. Uh, we've been going for almost an hour and 40 minutes. I think I'm going to need to step away soon. Um, but before we did did drop off, I did want to want to kind of check with you and see what you've been what you've been drinking. This is the Single Malt Strategy Podcast, of course. So uh, what uh, I'm guessing you're not drinking scotch. No, I'm saving that for our 20th uh anniversary episode so hopefully people uh stick around for that because i will be drinking scotch uh no i uh today i've been um i've been on and off in the beginning of the night i've tried some uh you know really shitty beers like the belgium ranger and uh stone ipa which were really really not good um and so i got home and i went back to my original called the wapo uh but i want to make a shout out to uh parkway get bent i know it's a weird name mountain ipa uh i was at a bar uh, over the weekend with uh one of my friends and uh it was we were bullshitting and she was like you know you're seeming and you're enjoying that beer and this beer was incredible it is a parkway uh parkway get bent mountain ipa and it's uh it's local to virginia and just had a shitload of hops in it and it was just oh man it was so good and uh yeah if i if i could recommend a beer right there if you're in virginia which majority of you guys are not uh if you get if you, if you see this in your local fridge which probably you're not going to see because it's a very local brewery uh it's an incredible um it's an incredible beer it's an incredible ipa uh but if you're shit out of options um i would go with el wapo or anything that's local um, a good example of today being a really bad day is, you know, I went to the bar with one of my friends and she was like an hour late and I'm, I'm just sitting at the bar and I'm having, you know, they were out of everything local. And all I had to choose was like New Belgium and uh, very something, very uh, beers that are very regional and, you know, East Coast or West Coast beers. They're very big and they weren't good. And I was just like, shit, you know, I just spent like $24 on three beers and it was like, yeah, they weren't good at all. I mean, it was just, uh, there's a big difference between craft beers that are local and regional beers. I just, uh, okay. Um, I've, uh, I actually was having some, uh, Sam Adams, uh, their summer beer, oh. uh, like their, their summer ale, oh, their blonde ale. Wait, wait, hold on. You've been having beer. I, I mean, I not, that's not what I'm drinking right now. I'm just saying you're, you're oh. saying there's a big difference between local beer or like craft beer or, you know, not craft beer. And I was just going to oh, say, I thought you were going to have a beer right now. I was like, wow. I'm, I didn't say <laughs> I don't, that. I don't, on the 20th anniversary that you, we would switch. 20th episode, I think is what we said. Yeah. yeah 20th. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I actually am drinking a beer today. Uh, I had a little bit of, uh, Johnny Walker green earlier today, but, uh, I'm sipping a spotted cow, which I've talked about before. It's a, Wisconsin beer only available in Wisconsin. It's a, um, I will, uh, it's a, I think it's a corn based ale. Um, but yeah, so it's kind of the, the feature beer of new Glarus. It's a nice kind of sweet, uh, not, not overly sweet, but just kind of a nice, easy to drink sweet ale, uh, that is, is actually more popular in Wisconsin than any other beer, including all the macro beers. Uh, and it's quite good. Yeah. I, uh, I'm not big on the you know, overly I... hoppy beer, personally. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, for some reason, you know, and then again, you know, it's it's an IPA thing, you know. I guess it's like a fad that's going on in the 2000s. Uh, you know, first, uh, I don't know what it is. I, you know, I, I I've been trying to uh, transition from like IPAs to you know something more, a uh, little bit more, uh, you know more mature in terms of like, you know, something like, um, you know, scotch or whiskey or whatever it may be. And, you know, I have my phases, you know, during Christmas time, it's, you know, bring out the Jack Daniels and, you know, pour that in a nice glass and oh, damn, that's, oh, it tastes so good. and it smells so good. Uh, but for nine tenths of the year, 
for some reason, the IPA is, you know, I don't know what it is. I think it's just the amount of hops, but, uh, you know, I can't get away from it. I, I was, uh, I was, uh, resort to, uh, going to hops, uh, you know, and I always go to like Starbucks, uh, nearby and, uh, don't, don't think I get like one of those fruity drinks or anything like that. I always get it like a cold ice, cold coffee and, uh, I get black coffee all the time. And, uh, you know, after I get it at Starbucks, I'm like, all right, should I go to the supermarket and get an IPA or should I go to the, uh, you know, um, uh, liquor store, which is down, you know, literally two blocks, uh, not two blocks, two stores down and get a nice scotch. Now I'm always like, you know, I'm like, I know Matt would pressure me to get to the, to the sky, you know, to the liquor store and get a nice, beautiful scotch. And I'm like, you know, I start walking that way and I'm like making my way there and I start my left, you know, my left uh, foot starts leaning to the left and my right starts leaning to the right. And I'm like, you know what? Forget about it. I'm going to get myself a nice cold IPA. And uh, I wind myself up in the uh, marketplace get a nice cold uh, El Wapo and uh, get home. And I'm like, yeah, Matt's going to chew me out a little bit for this, but you know what? I'm going to enjoy myself tonight. So I drink, I drink plenty of beer. I don't know why you're thinking like I'm some kind of scotch snob. Um, oh, I, thought you, I, I thought you only drink scotch. I never said I only drink scotch. I generally drink scotch during the show because we're called the single malt strategy podcast. So I figured if we're doing a podcast that has the basically named scotch in it, um, you know, I might as well be drinking scotch while we're, uh, while we're recording. So if I took that scotch from you, if you had to choose one beer to replace it, you could choose any beer right now. What would that be? Please don't say Bud Light. Jesus, please. No. Um, I mean, I told you I'm drinking a craft beer right now. Um, probably maybe Moon Man, which is a, another beer by New Glarus. Uh, it's, a it's a little bit hoppier than Spotted Cow. It's kind of like a almost like a a brown ale in terms of Ooh. the 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 amount of hops in it, but it's a little bit smoother. It's I want to say it's a wheat beer uh, with a little bit of a kick to it. Oh, nice! I like that. It's, I'm assuming that's a regional kind of like a local craft. Beer. Yeah, it's only available in Wisconsin. <sighs> See, that's the problem. I you know, a hey, for you entrepreneurs out there. I want to point this out. You know, there is no app store app where I can buy an a craft brewery from any place on, you know, in the U.S. where I can, you know, get Nats, I, you know, local brown, um, you know, uh, whatever. What was it? What, what beer did you have? Uh, Spotted Cow, or that's the one I'm drinking right now, uh, which I'm going to read off the fine bottle. Spotted Cow adheres to the Reinhatzgebot purity laws, using only four hand-selected all-natural ingredients, yeast, hops, water, and malted barley. We allow the yeast to remain in the bottle to enhance the fullness of flavors, so it's naturally cloudy. Expect this ale to be fun, fruity, and satisfying. You know you're in Wisconsin when you're seeing the Spotted Cow. (laughs) I like that. Oh, that's good. Anyway, I That's think awesome. I think uh I think we're about uh about done with this episode. We've almost been going for 2 hours, so probably more rambling by now if anyone's actually still listening. Um <laughs> any closing thoughts, John? No, uh the only uh thing that I would want to mention is uh be sure to check in for the next episode because our, our next episode is going to be dealing with the uh topic I want to discuss the most which is, uh, you know, a little bit of a battle star and a little bit of a Galactica and uh, just a lot of... uh, You don't need to be so coy about it. I think everybody knows the game is coming. (laughs) Well, uh, (laughs) I mean, they did did announce the launch date. It'll be uh, August 31st. There's tons of news coming out. I just did, uh, I'm going to release uh, something on my channel uh, tomorrow uh, with the interview with the Battlestar Galactica producer. And uh, me and Matt are going to have tons of comments and news about the beta that we've been playing the last couple of weeks uh, on our next episode, which will be very soon. And uh, you guys don't want to miss it because honestly, 
Uh, I don't want to like spoil anything. I probably will, but I will say this is the best sci-fi strategy game I've played probably in the last two decades. And that's big for me to say because it's that fracking good. And I'm going to leave it at that because, uh, you know, I'm going to, you know, Slytherin just announced that it's coming out for the 31st. Um, y'all, my personal opinion, if if you want a good Battlestar Galactica strategy game, uh, circle that around your calendars because it's, oh, man, I've played the beta and I know you played it, Matt, and I don't know your opinions. And we're going to save it for the next podcast, but it's, uh, you know, it, it's a game that I think we both uh, uh, have been pleasantly, incredibly impressed with. I'm going to get in trouble here and say I've played it for like five minutes so far. I just haven't had the time. <laughs> God, yeah, well, I, I knew you played it more than five minutes. I mean, you, you, had, the re- I mean, you had the beta before me, I think. Yeah, no, I'm still still telling you the truth. I've played it like five minutes. <laughs> well, hopefully uh, by our next podcast, we'll uh, rank up some times. And uh, our next podcast might go a little bit longer because, uh, you know, um, I'll, I'll be honest, guys. I'm a big Battlestar Galactica, uh, you know. I You know, I wasn't a big fan of it uh you know before the uh before one of my friends at apple uh kind of recommended the show to me and i was like dude i don't think anything can replace uh star wars or star trek or anything like that but this show uh when i watched it i don't know if you guys watched the uh remake of the 2000 series and the you know drama and the you know the craziness of it and to make it as a strategy game i feel like I'm going to save all my, uh, you know, expectations, opinions for the the next episode, but, uh, you know, not to just to put it out there is just this, this is the game I've been waiting for since (sighs) for years that I could put that, you know, I I could put out, you know, it's just finally a a fracking publisher and a, a developer step forward and say, we got this. And it's yeah i mean i can tell you when i'm at the bar and i'm having a nice cold beer i'm like shit one thing on my head is just like i want to go back home because i need to play me some battlestar galactica and for a game for to do that i haven't that hasn't happened since like the early 2000s so it's been about 20 years since a game for me made me kind of say all right i need to get my ass back home to play this game um, so we're going to discuss it more in our next episode. Uh, and I, I look forward to Matt's opinions on it because uh, his, uh, his opinions are very uh, I- I- instrumental in the way the uh, strategy game industry is going. So I, I look forward. I, I hope. Uh, wow. Don't, don't give me too much. I don't think I have any influence, but thank you for, uh, for, for that. Well, you know, I, you know, honestly, you know, that's, I, I, I really look forward to your opinion. So hopefully, uh, you know, uh, we can get a couple of hours, uh, under the hood and I want to, I'm really looking forward to your opinions and your comments and recommendations, you know, and, uh, on how they can improve or, uh, on, uh, your thoughts on the game and such. All right. Well, I, I'm definitely looking forward to it as well. And I want to tune, I thank everybody for tuning in for yet another long podcast, uh, almost two hours. So I uh, hope, uh, hope we didn't put you all to sleep by now. But if so, maybe it's an effective sleep aid for those of you who are hey, trouble, trouble driving sleeping. From, you know, if they're doing a long vacation, this, this is a good podcast. <laughs> if anybody is still listening, please don't hesitate to leave a review for the podcast on uh, iTunes. Uh, if you listen to it there, uh, that does help us. Uh, a lot. Uh, But with that being said, guys, thanks again for tuning in, and then I will go ahead and close this out for episode 16. For Jean and myself, uh, thanks again, guys, and until next time, we're out.